11, Romans 11 and uh, for Second Peter, Second Peter chapter 1. <clears throat> that auction was fun last night. Especially when Luke didn't know I was bidding. Sitting right next to him. Who's doing that bidding? I don't know. Romans 11 and 2 Peter chapter 1. Seems kind of loud. Is that loud? No? Okay. Turn my hearing aid down. Okay, Romans 11. Uh, this... Um, letter Paul wrote to the church of Rome, and the first eight chapters he's uh, directed it to uh, the believer, and starting in chapter 9 and through 11, he, he deals with the subject of Israel, the nation of Israel. So Romans 11, 1, I say then, hath God cast away his people? <clears throat> okay, God forbid, for I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham of the tribe of Benjamin. Uh, God hath not cast away his people, which he foreknew. Want you not what the scriptures saith of Elias, how he maketh intercession to God against Israel, saying, Lord, they have killed thy prophets, and dig down thine altars, and I am left alone, and they seek my life. What, uh, but what saith the answer of God unto him? I have reserved to myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. Even so then, at this present time, also there's a remnant according to the election of grace. Okay, a remnant of Israel, verse 5, going back to verse 1. There's a remnant of Israel. And then he says, and if by grace, then it is no more of works, otherwise grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then it is no more grace, otherwise work is no more work. What then? Israel hath not obtained that which he seeketh for. But the election hath obtained it, and the rest were blinded. Okay, at the end of verse 7, you see it's not punctuated. No punctuation, no comma, no colon. That's seven times in the Bible that that happens. And the completion of the sentence is after the paragraph mark of verse 8. So he says, the election hath obtained it, but the rest were blinded unto this day. At the end of verse 8. And then in the parentheses is a mention of an Old Testament passage, which is the most repeated uh, verse in the New Testament that I know of, found in seven extra times in the New Testament. According as is written, God hath given them the spirit of slumber, eyes that they should not see, ears that they should not hear. Okay, hold your finger there if you want to keep that open, and let's try Second Peter, Second Peter. The second epistle general of Peter, generally it's aimed at tribulation time period, anything from Hebrews on, generally speaking. Okay, and uh, he writes to, uh, in verse 1, he writes to people who have obtained the like precious faith. So verse 1, Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained like precious faith, with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. According as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness, through the knowledge of him that has called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these... You might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Okay, so verse 4 says you might be. It's not saying that you will be. We have promises, verse 4, that will help the believer become a partaker of the divine nature. Okay, but each of us have to live, you know, based on our free will, what we're going to do with that. Verse 5, beside this, giving all diligence. So we have to be diligent to complete the following. Add to your faith virtue, to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance God, uh, patience, and to patience godliness, 
and to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, charity. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacketh these things, okay, verses 5, 6, 7, 8, lacks these things, is blind. He cannot see it far off. Yeah, but if he's blind, he can't see it all. Unless there's a form of blindness, like legally blind. Okay, so this is a believer that is blind. Some form of blindness. But he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see it far off and have forgotten that he has purged from his own sins. Okay, let's go ahead and pray. Lord, I do ask you to help us to have eyes that we might see, ears that we might hear, and help us to have these until we see you face to face. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, these two passages show us that a saved individual can be blind spiritually. That's what these two passages are showing us. Okay, now in the Second Peter passage where he says blind and cannot see afar off. Now, in our culture, that would be called legally blind. Uh, I served in a church in Colorado Springs for a couple years, two and a half years, and in Colorado Springs or out on the plain, they, uh, the smaller schools would have eight-man tackle football, okay? We had 14 boys in the school, 13 were on the team, okay? And uh, it was one of those where these guys had has grown up together from seventh grade up, and of the 13, uh, eight of them were very... I mean, they, were, they knew how each other played, and it was one of those where you're going to have a good year, and then from then, the next seven years is going to be horrible. Okay, and so uh, these uh, fellows that we had, our uh, center was legally blind. The left guard was 110 pounds soaking wet. The right guard was 140 40 pounds soaking wet. Okay, and those guys went undefeated that year. Okay, and so we actually went to Tennessee, got a part of a, a camp, won a nationals thing. And the 110-pound kid had to block a kid who's like 250. And we said, just hit him low. And he said, yeah, you're going to step on my face too. Uh, but the entire game, he moved that guy wherever he wanted. Him, and the other coach said he's never seen anybody do that to that kid. Okay, but this kid who was legally blind, okay, come nighttime, he could not see anything. And uh, even in the daytime, some guys were playing catch with a softball, and a guy threw it at him, hit him right in the face. He didn't even see it. Okay, but at nighttime, he could see nothing. And we had some night ga- a couple night games. And so in the huddle, they would tell him, block right, block left. This way or this way. Because he could not see the guy. Legally blind. Okay, and you got to admire him. And he would just go hit whoever was there, and he's just hoping he's hitting them. Okay, but uh, as far as eyesight goes, okay, uh, in this passage, salvation, obviously, being born again, enlightens a person's eyes to at least the gospel. Okay, where our conscience become alert, and we see things differently right at the beginning, our eyes have been enlightened to the pure gospel of Jesus Christ. Paul said in Acts 26, 18, that he's come to open their eyes, to turn them from darkness to light, from the power of Satan unto God, uh, even a forgiveness of sins and an inheritance to them that are sanctified. So he's got those eye-opening things, and just believing in the gospel of Jesus Christ opens our eyes. Now, at that moment, because of faith in Jesus Christ, The Spirit of God has been placed into the body of the born-again believer. He's the earnest. He's the down payment. Now, he has been placed in the believer so that this enlightenment can continue. But why is it that so few continue with it? Why is it that so many believers are blind? It's because they're not claiming the promise of the Spirit. And they're not meeting the inward qualities that God can work with. Sincerity, honesty, humility, meekness. Okay, and so God's not working with a prideful heart. Maybe saved, just saved as you and I, but he's got a prideful heart. God says, okay, the, the light switch is not going to come on. Got to hit that light switch. What hits the light switch of enlightenment is sincerity and honesty, meekness and 
humility. That's all attitudes with inside. Now, the Spirit of God provides enlightenment to the believer. He's the promise. And John 16, 13 says that he's promised to guide us in all truth. Now, Paul encouraged us to pray that our eyes are enlightened. Ephesians 1, 18, great prayer. So that tells us we do have to pray for this enlightenment, and then God reads our heart and, and then to see if he's going to willingly enlighten our eyes. Now, some folks are satisfied with the fundamentals. That just works for them, and that's all we want to know. And so after talking and listening to them for preaching about three months, you got all they're going to give you because that's all they know. They don't want anything else. Okay, and so they are nearsighted or farsighted, okay, or maybe they have astigmatism or presbyopia or legally blind or cataracts. Okay, and so uh, cataracts is a thing that usually hits the older, older folks. Mom was getting some cataracts, so she tried to neutral, uh, the neutralizer in her eyes, kept that up, and cataract went away. Okay, and so uh, you have different methods. Okay, and so you have different eyesights. Now, I cheated. I went and got LASIK, okay, where things are kind of getting blurry from a distance, and so uh, I got LASIK, and I thought, well, maybe we can do a two-for-one. Maybe my wife can get it. But it would make her see far, and she liked to see near. And she said, no way, Jose. I want to be able to see near. So on near stuff, I give it to her. She reads it. Far stuff, I got it taken care of. Okay, but LASIK is not for, like, four feet and closer. Okay, and so that's what worked for me. And so... As we see that there are physical different eyesights, as the older we get, you see more glasses sticking on our faces. Why are they going bad? Okay, the same is true in spiritual matters. There are saved people everywhere that, ha- that need glasses, that are farsighted. Farsighted, they're always looking at the prophecies. Nearsighted. They're only looking at the numbers of the church and see what's going on tomorrow and the next week. So all they're seeing is right up what's going on in front of me. Okay, and so you got these different eye issues. So I'm going to give you some thoughts about spiritual blindness. Yes, of the believer. A believer can be blind. Bad, bad eyesight. Okay, the first thing is that the Lord Jesus Christ gave sight. Okay, as far as somebody being blind and they're heading toward knowledge is one thing, but somebody who has walked up to knowledge and turned around and walked away, that's a willful blindness. That's much difficult to overcome, if it can be overcome. Okay, so the Lord Jesus Christ, there was at least four occasions in the Gospels where a blind individual crossed the path of Jesus and they walked away seeing. Okay, with 2020 or whatever. One of, the pers- one of the men or people is in Matthew 9, and this guy, where he came across Jesus, Jesus Christ touched him, and he got his eyesight. Okay, another fella in uh, John chapter 9, where this was a kid, a guy was born blind, and then he was of age, and in his case, Jesus spit on the ground, spit on the dirt, and uh, made a little mud pie, and he said, here's mud in your eye, pal. And he's, then he said, go wash in a pool of sil- siloam. And the guy said, of course, yeah, I'm going to go do that. My, my face is all dirty. And once he did that, he got his eyesight. Another guy in Mark chapter 8, Jesus just flat spit in his face. You know, where the guy's blind, he said, hey, come over here. You're all right, here's right, right in your face. And the guy got his eyesight. Okay, and then there was another fella in in Mark chapter 10 where Jesus just looked at him and said, Your faith has saved thee. And he got his eyesight strictly by faith. No touch, no spit. He was probably glad of that one. Okay, and so you got different variations. Now, I'm sure those four guys got together later you know, where they're happy to see, and they got together, and they got arguing about how Jesus heals the blind. And they got a big argument, and they split up and made four different denominations. Okay, and that just shows God is a God of variety. 
Okay, now these seem to imply different methods that God enlightens our eyes. Okay, where the guy that uh, Jesus touched him, that's, that's a popular one on the TV, you know, where the guy's on TV, you know, I'll come here, I'll touch you, touch the TV and you'll be healed. Okay, and now that's a popular one, but the guy that he was touched by Jesus Christ seems to imply that there are people that will help guide you to the truth. Okay, the Ethiopian eunuch was reading the Bible. And he had had to have somebody explain it to him. And that was Philip. And so that, that works, where a lot of times you learn the Bible from somebody else because they were there actually helping you. Okay, the fellow that got spit in the face. Now, I don't care what culture it is. Somebody spits in your face, that's an insult. Okay, so that's a universal thing, international throughout the whole world. If you get spit in the face, they are definitely insulting you. And when it came from God himself, Jesus Christ, this is one method that God enlightens people's eyes, is that he humbles you. He insults you. God puts you in a position where it's insulting to your life. The example in the Bible is Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar was a king a king of kings, first international king. And so how did God get his attention from his pride? He put him in a funny farm. I mean, the high guy's hair grew out like cousin it, and his fingernails grew out, and they told him to go to the back 40 and eat this bale of hay, and he was still king. So when they toured the White House of Babylonia, they said, anybody want to go see the king? And, they, and they'd go out back and they'd whistle and here he comes, all fours, and give him some hay and said, there's your king. I mean, that would be a humbling experience. And Nebuchadnezzar said, how long did I, was I in that position? Until I realized that he can walk, make those who are in pride until they're abased. That was a humbling situation. And so there are some times in life where you and I get humbled by our reactions by God himself. And if we don't pay attention to it, then we're going to miss out on the truth. Another person like that is the woman of Canaan. Remember the lady of Canaan where her daughter had uh, was gotten a Pokemon when she was a little girl. And she'd been reading you know, Harry Potter and all that stuff. And she was demon possessed. And her mom said to Jesus, can you heal my daughter? And Jesus Christ ignored the woman. So she kept it up. And then Jesus Christ called her a dog. Get out of here, dog. And the disciples were trying to get rid of her. And she came back and said, yeah, that's right, I'm a dog, but at least the dogs eat the crumbs. That was an insult from Jesus Christ. But she got her answer to prayer because she accepted the insult. Okay, so that's the one where it gets spit in the face. Now, taking clay of the spittle... The, clay, the dirt and the spit put together. Well, clay is obviously a picture of man, so that would be a humbling experience from a man. Maybe it's your critic that's criticizing you. And God says, you need to pay attention. Even a critic can get us right. Okay, David paid attention to Shimei when he was throwing rocks and dust in the air and his... And his Soldier was saying, man, let's kill that guy. And David said, let him go, let him go. He's probably speaking to me of the Lord. You see? And an example of that is in the Bible was Abimelech. Where Abimelech had his dream, and in the dream, God says, you're a dead man, pal. He said, whoa, why is this? He said, well, the woman you got is a man's wife. Whoa, I didn't know that. I just did the integrity of my heart. He said, well, you go talk to Abraham. And in that case, Abimelech was the man right. Abraham was wrong. Okay, and that was a terrible experience. And then God turned around and told Abraham, you need to reprove Abimelech about something that, that's going on. Okay, now if somebody was a, was a hypocrite and they're going to try to tell you something about the Bible, are you going to be willing to accept it? It's like, get out of my face, you two-bit hypocrite. Yeah, but Abimelech accepted it. Humbling experience from man, he accepted it. Why? Because truth is truth no matter who says it. You see? The only difference between a, wa a broken watch and a left-wing liberal, at least a watch is right twice a day. 
Okay, and so, I mean, you've got to figure that one out. Okay, but even at that, there's a humbling experience from man. Now, the majority of it, hopefully, where Jesus said to the one fellow, he said, your faith has made you whole. Now, where do we get our faith from? That book. If you just get your nose in this book, you'll get a lot of truth that a lot of people miss out on. And it's just believe in the words. You see, where you got these four different methods, Jesus enlightens somebody's eyes, and these four methods are available to each of us. Are we willing to get them? Okay, so the second thought is this. In Romans chapter 11, we read that Israel, the election is going to be a part of the, the promise. Has God cast away his people? Romans 11, has God cast away his people in the context of Israel? Well, the Catholic Church says he has. The Mormon says he has. The JW says he has. And now when the church is saying that he has, that's a good sign. For the ones that know he hasn't. Okay, in Romans chapter 11, what we see is, first off, a believer can be blinded. In Romans 11, Israel was blinded. Now, if you go back to Israel's history, when they exited out of Egypt, that's a picture of salvation. They were saved by the blood, Passover blood. They saw the ten miracles, the plagues and all that involved, and they exited out of Egypt, wandered over there, walked over there to the Red Sea, had the Red Sea crossing, picture of the rapture, or whatever, and then they go into uh, the wilderness for a time being, and God says, I want you to go into the land of Canaan. And they thought, man, that's just too much. And you see them guys over there? Man, they are big. I mean, the bulls should go over there and get a couple of them guys. Man, they'd love to have a guy like that on their team. Okay, it's just that they're not real bright, but I mean, still good over there. And they said no, and what happened? They went back to the wilderness and were wandering in a circle for 40 years. You know that's where most believers are at? Wandering from one doctrine to this doctrine to that doctrine to this church, back around, and they never get settled because they don't have the faith. They've rejected some things from the word of God. You see, after the exodus, after all the miracles of Israel, they were blinded. Now, what's the usual declaration of somebody who says that somebody's promoting a false doctrine? They're blind. They're lost and going to hell. That's the usual. If you don't agree with me, you're going to hell. The guy out in Phoenix, Arizona, a guy named Steve Anderson... You know, he and Sam Gipp kind of been trading YouTube stuff back and forth. And Sam Gipp, we've had him here a couple of times. And so Steve says that Sam is going to hell because he believes gospel in the Old Testament is different than it is in the New Testament just because he believes that he's going to hell. I mean, that, that's how people are. You know, just because somebody don't agree with uh, your viewpoint doesn't mean they're going to hell. But that's the typical. Like, you mean to tell me that a believer cannot promote a false doctrine? It says in 2 Timothy chapter 4 that there will come a time when they will not endure sound doctrine. Who's do they? Lost people? They don't care about doctrine. That's saved people. And that's where the church is at. So this revelation of Romans 11 shows that a believer can be blinded or, shall we say, have bad eyesight. Now the second thing in chapter 11, who does the blinding? God orders it. God is the one that ordered it. Satan is the one that fulfilled it. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 says that Satan is blind in their minds. In that context, the blinding of their minds is Israel. It's the blindness of Israel. God's the one that ordered it. Why did he order it? They rejected something he wanted them to believe. Hosea chapter 4 verse 6 is a verse that's used, I've heard this thing hundreds of times. 
My people are just trying for lack of knowledge. And they never read the rest of the verse. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Why? It's because they had the knowledge and rejected it. It wasn't that they never got the knowledge. They were offered it and rejected it. That's why God blinded them. And there are certain issues or truths or ideas or topics that God might bring your way. And he wants you to study it. He wants you to get settled on whatever this thing is. Okay? And the thing is, ask the Lord to guide you on that idea. Now, when the Lord was, on, during his ministry, he said to the religious fundamentalist of his day, in Matthew 23, he said, you are the blind lead the blind. Why? They were willfully blind. Those people were willfully blind. That's the religious leaders. That's why Jesus Christ hammered those guys. They willfully wanted that way. It's like when Pilate said to Jesus, what is truth? And then walked out and didn't even wait for the answer. Okay, and that's what's happening in the church today. Okay, another idea we get from this thing in Romans 11 is first that a believer can be blinded after faith in salvation... And then God is the one who initiates the blindness because that believer has rejected some topic that God wanted them to accept or believe. And the final truth in, in Romans 11 is that the blindness of the church is the false belief that God's done with Israel. That's Romans 11. When you hear Baptists now saying that the church is Israel and Israel is the church, a guy I went to school with. I mean, I went to this Bible school. I mean, they were, not, they were not good on doctrine, but they were good on soul winning or at least getting people to pray a prayer. Okay, but a friend of mine that went to school, I saw him in his video, and he comes flat out and says that the church is Israel. I said, man, you got a college degree and you can't read church and Israel are two separate things? How do you miss that? I mean, they only have one letter that's the same. It's the letter R. And you're saying they're the same thing? What happened? Somebody got bad eyesight. And when the church has gotten to there... Now, the Catholic Church has been saying this for years. Okay, they've said God's done with Israel. We're the priesthood. And we're going to be the one that brings in the utopia. The Mormons have said this. The, the two fellows that you'll see, the young fellows, the blonde hair, blue eyes, that got elder on their little badge says that they're Ephraimites, Jews. And then the JWs, they say, they say they're the Israel. And now you see fundamentalists saying that they're Israel. That's the final straw for Laodicea. Revelation chapter 3, what did the people in Laodicea say? The church in Laodicea, what did they say? We're rich and have need of nothing. And the Lord says, no, nope, you're miserable, you're poor, you're blind, you're naked, you're blind. Why? They can't figure out who the church is. If a born-again believer says to you, I'm Israel, look at him and say, well, you need to get saved. What do you mean by that? There's three different groups in the Bible. Jew, Gentile, Church of God. That's the one I want to be in. Now, I know Paul is saying physically I'm an Israelite, but he was a member of the church of Rome and Corinth and Ephesus. All three of them, he said, I'm a member there. That was his spiritual distinction. In Christ, there's neither Jew nor Greek. So if somebody who claims a believer and they say they're Israel, just look at it and say, are you telling me you're lost? Well, you got to be in the bride of Christ, my brother. Forget Israel. Forget about those promises. Get into promises with Christ. That's where it's at. You see, and that is the, that's the final straw, really, of Laodicea. And we can, whew, man, your redemption draweth nigh. Praise God for that. Now, this thing on blindness... For the believer, what's the common attitude that each of the individuals had 
when after before Jesus Christ healed them? What was a common attribute that they displayed? They begged for mercy. People tell them, shut up. And what did they do? They screamed louder. And so what is the common attitude we need to have to continue to have some decent eyesight and to see what God wants to see? Keep begging him for mercy. Just keep begging God for mercy. Colossians chapter 1, uh, verses 21. 21 is a, one of the seven verses that doesn't have a punctuation. And it runs from verse 21 down to 29. And it's talking about standing perfect in Christ Jesus. And Colossians 1, 23 says, If ye continue in the faith, grounded and settled. And so forth. And the idea is, continue to beg God for mercy that you see what he wants you to see. Don't change a word. Don't subtract a word. Don't change the meaning of it. Don't add a word to the Bible. Don't subtract a word. Don't change them. Believe what he wants you. What what if it's an outlandish thing that uh, a lot of people don't believe? So what? It doesn't matter. In John chapter 6, many of the disciples walked away from Jesus because he told them the truth about eating the bread, symbolizing his body. And it was so outlandish to them, they left. And I, I guarantee that when they died and went to heaven, because they were followers of Jesus Christ, but until then, that they said, boy, we weren't paying real attention, were we? No, you weren't. And you missed out because you weren't paying attention. You didn't believe the actual words that he was saying. Jesus said... The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. I'm talking to you spiritually, fellas. Do you pick up on that? They missed that. And they ran out the door. He's preaching heresy. He's going to hell. No, you're the one that blinded yourself. That Isaiah chapter 6, that idea is that God told Isaiah, I want you to preach to Israel. He said, how long? He said, until they're blinded. That's how long. That verse is repeated in Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts 28, Romans 11, and Hebrews 5. Seven times in the New Testament. Why? The end of every age, the believers in Jesus Christ or God Old Testament are blind as a body of people. Now the individual, individual Roman, Revelation chapter 3, Jesus is at the door knocking. That individual that believes him, he'll come in to them and sup with them. And that's where we're at in this age. It's individuals here, 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 everywhere. And yet we're going to feel like we're the only ones, because that's what Elijah said. I'm the only one. Lord said, ah, I got 7,000. You just don't know where they're at. If you had a convention, you have 7,000, you'd get too big for your britches. And so I'm just going to leave you all scattered all over the place, just so you don't get too big for your britches thinking you're doing a great work for God when you're really not. You see? And this is the blindness. Yes, a believer can be blind. And so how do we overcome it? Beg God for mercy. Beg God for mercy and continue continue to seek after Him. Be open to Him. Okay, let's pray. Lord, I do pray and ask that you'd help us to be continual students of your word, continual students of truth, whatever topic, whatever subject, whatever doctrine, whatever belief or idea that you want us to believe, uh, help us to believe it, to study it, search it out, be fully persuaded. If it's an unusual thing, Lord, help us to just, hey, man, I never heard that before. Boy, that's out there. I, boy, I don't know about that one. Lord, enlighten me. And it's just a matter of being enlightened to the words of God, to the truth that God leads us and guides us. Lord, I pray you'd help us to be like them blind beggars that begged you for mercy that they could see. And Lord, I pray you'd help us to be ones who continually beg you that we might be able to see, see all areas of life that you want us to see. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Okay, we're dismissed.